Hello and good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited to be here with all of you today for our webinar topic of No Money, No Mission, Crisis Residential Funding in the United States. My name is Tess Parker. I'm a clinical consultant here with TBD Solutions, and I'd like to introduce Travis Atkinson. Hello, everyone. I'm Travis Atkinson, the Director of Clinical and Crisis Services with TBD Solutions. And just to make sure that our tech is working right, because we're trying a new format today. Uh, Alex, would you mind just uh, unmuting and let us know if you can hear our audio fine and if everything's working OK? OK, I see a thumbs up. That's good news. Um, so we are going to uh, go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to share just a little bit, first of all, about TBD Solutions before we get into the webinar today. Uh, we are a behavioral health training, research, and consulting firm. Uh, we have uh, projects uh, and customers all across the country. Um, our why is that we believe every community member deserves access to high quality behavioral health services. Uh, we get there by helping organizations of all sizes to answer difficult questions through consultation and research and training. And some of the services that we offer include crisis system development and enhancement, data analytics, policy research, and training and technical assistance. While crisis work is not the only thing that we do, uh, Tess and I and our clinical cohort are proud to have many years of experience working in, operating, and overseeing uh, many parts of the crisis continuum. So Tess, before we get into our funding uh, results today, tell us about the crisis continuum and what people can expect when they're in a behavioral health crisis today in America. Yeah, certainly, Travis. So let's start first with an individual or a person who is experiencing a crisis because that's where it all starts. And prior to, I just want to set the stage and share that prior to uh, around the 1960s or 1970s, an individual experiencing a behavioral health crisis had far fewer options than they have today. So their options were limited to uh, presenting to an emergency department. Often that came by way of getting there by police drop off or by EMS. And from there, if they needed more uh, acute or services from there, they they're really their only option was to receive care at a psychiatric inpatient unit. So I just want to set the stage uh, and that we've come a really long way. So now today, a person in crisis. We have a crisis call center. Uh, certainly 988 has been the hype recently. So this is kind of your first stop shop for people to call, uh, get support, get coordinated and linked to services. From there, we also have mobile crisis teams. So serving adults as well as MRSS teams, serving youth experiencing a crisis. Mobile crisis teams are an incredible asset to our current crisis continuum because they provide behavioral health services in the community where the individual is experiencing their crisis and also diverting them from places like the emergency department or the jail. The emergency department or emergency room certainly still has a place in our continuum. And from there, individuals can go to a lot of different places, but you'll notice that many of these that we're going to talk about, and certainly the one we're going to talk about today, are community based. So for the most acute individuals needing care, we still have psychiatric hospitals. Then we also have options such as 23 hour observation units that have easy access and drop off for police and law enforcement. Uh, places where people can be for up to 23 hours who are experiencing a crisis. Crisis residential units, which are going to be the bread and butter of what we're talking about today, which are also called other names, which Travis will talk to us about here shortly. And then we also have Partial hospitalization programs, also known as PHPs, so uh, day programs in the community where the focus is really the milieu and on group therapy, but those individuals can return home at night to their lived environment. And last but certainly not least, we have peer respite. So uh, these are services in the community, often in neighborhoods or home-like settings that are operated by individuals with lived experience. So this is just a little bit of a look at our current behavioral health crisis system. Travis, I'm wondering if you could share with us nationally what the research shows. Um, well, the research shows that, um, first of all, people do well in less restrictive environments. 
Uh, and when you can bear a little bit more risk, like uh, the providers do in these crisis continuums, you get to reap a, a lot of rewards. Now, the context for some of these services, we're going to talk about uh, two sources. One is the National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care Best Practice Toolkit. Uh, now, in, in this toolkit, SAMHSA defines three areas uh, of a crisis continuum. Someone to talk to, someone to respond, and a place to go. And for today's purposes, we'll be talking about this third step of the continuum, which is a place to go. If you look at the group for the advancement of psychiatry's roadmap to the ideal crisis system, which was published uh, by uh, the National Council for Mental Wellbeing last year, uh, you notice a few more steps that are included. There, it's, it's more of a, of a comprehensive uh, approach to crisis care options. And you, so you can see many of the, the the service types test that you talked about. And then down at the bottom here, we have residential crisis programs. And that is going to be our area of focus today as we talk about the results of our survey. So Trav, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about crisis residential units and best practice. So common themes or components that the majority of uh, these units might have in the United States. Sure. And my experience or exposure to crisis residential comes from working in these programs, fresh out of graduate school, uh, oversaw a 16 bed facility. And uh, you know some of the features that we're gonna talk about here are very consistent uh, with the crisis residential units uh, near where I live. So first of all, it's a short term stay. So it's an average sometimes of five days. Uh, most programs uh, go up to 14 days, although in places like California, we see crisis residential go as far as 28 days for their length of stay. Uh, this is happening in a home-like environment. So some of the first early crisis residential programs were literally inside of a home, inside of a, a Victorian two-story was the very first one, inside of a ranch house, uh, in these inconspicuous places, oftentimes within neighborhoods, because it's based on this premise that home uh, can naturally be a healing environment. And if you have the choice, um, you would prefer to be somewhere that resembles home. Even if they are in a home, it's important that they're in a home-like environment. So we've seen some crisis residential programs that are located inside of, let's say, an, an old nursing facility, a nursing home facility. Um, in that case, it really matters the type of environment that you create with the pictures that you put on the wall, the use of the, the color schemes, the furniture, anything to make it feel warm and inviting. Mm. The next is that there's at least four hours of psychosocial group education every day. So people should be involved in some kind of support group. Uh, these can be run by pretty much anybody that works in the crisis home. It doesn't have to be a clinician. It doesn't have to um, uh, be a nurse, but uh, your peer supports, your frontline staff, your, your uh, bachelor's level case managers, all of them can run uh, groups in a crisis residential program. And then peer support specialists play an integral role at a crisis residential or crisis stabilization unit. So uh, peer support should not have a token position where they're expected to, to make copies or complete discharge plans, but they should be brought in from the beginning as a vital contributor to a team. So there's approximately 700 crisis residential units in the United States. Uh, one of the largest types of crisis services of, of any of that continuum tests that you showed us uh, in the US. We have compiled a pretty exhaustive list of the nomenclature around crisis services. It's really important mm -hmm. because we have a national audience here today. And as we talk about these crisis services, they go by a lot of different names, uh, for close to 10 as a matter of fact. And so you can probably find your state somewhere on here, but we hear phrases like crisis respite, crisis stabilization, brief intervention programs, crisis resolution center, and so on. Um, one of the, the things that we lack in our uh, effort um, is uh, an understanding nationally of, of what a crisis service means. Like when we say crisis stabilization, where we are, it means one thing, but when we cross a state line, it means it's something different. Mm -hmm. So I saw a, a question come in, Tess, and I wonder if you could answer this. It said uh, about uh, how to involve peers in the admission process or how to get peer support specialists involved early on in crisis residential programs. Great question. So again, the question was how to integrate peer support specialists into the workflows or the policies and procedures early on in an individual stay in a crisis residential unit. 
So we've often seen peers used in many ways as it relates to admissions. First of all, involve them in the creation of admission policies and procedures and workflows. As individuals with lived experience and great insight, don't create, or if you can avoid creating any policies or procedures without their involvement or their buy-in, that can be really helpful. We commonly worked with our peer support specialists to be one of those first faces or touch points when a person entered the crisis residential unit or that home because they were able to build rapport with that individual in such a different and unique way. So in the same way we see peers used uh, as an alternative to build rapport in mobile crisis teams, the same is true for crisis residential units. That connection can be so authentic and powerful. And then just the continued involvement from admission all the way through discharge, have them be a consistent treatment person, uh, treatment provider in that individual stay. Yeah, and it's important to remember too that the people have a story to tell who are coming into the crisis residential programs, uh, but sometimes they don't want to tell it too many times. Uh, peer support specialists and recovery coaches can do a great job of getting uh, the details uh, elicited from that person who might be hesitant to talk. But in, to your point, Tess, as we talk about policies and procedures, you want to make sure that in the first 24 hours, you're not making that person tell their story too many times. Uh, if you can get everyone in the room at the same time, uh, you can align it with when the doctor is going to be there, perhaps. Then you're honoring their story, but then also everybody's hearing the same thing at the same time. And that can be helpful for a, a, a multi-systemic team to, or multi-disciplinary team, excuse me, to uh, come up with treatment plan goals mm -hmm. and, and, and options together. So Travis, I'm curious, as we dive into the substance of our webinar today, tell us a little bit about what inspired you or what was rooted in the why behind the National Crisis Residential Funding Survey. Well, Tess, I think it's important that providers understand how they relate to other providers, either in their state or in the country. Uh, that can be good for advocacy purposes. It can be good for maybe even patting yourself on the back if you say, hey, we're actually doing pretty well. Uh, but it's important that, that crisis residential providers are being paid what they're worth and also at least being paid what it costs to operate these services. As we'll talk about in our presentation today, sometimes crisis residential programs operate as a loss leader compared to uh, the other services that exist that an organization operates. And it really shouldn't be that way. That's not a good business model. Um, so, uh, you know, we we actually did this survey in 2019, which we're going to talk about in just a second, and, and have followed up with a nearly identical survey in 2022. So now we have some comparison data, and uh, we really haven't seen data collected uh, of this volume or magnitude as it pertains to funding. And we want to dive into that with y'all today as we talk about, um, you know, how do you fund a program and how are how are programs doing across the country? What can we learn from that? So as we compare the, the two surveys, there's there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, one is that we were able to pretty uh, more than double the number of responses that we received to this survey. So thank you to those that completed it. I'm sure some of you who are on the webinar today uh, have um, uh, ha had participated in the survey and, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, so getting nearly 100 responses uh, out of, of 700 programs is uh, very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very good sample size for us to draw from. And then the other is that 2019, as we um, can hopefully remember now that it's been years, was pre-pandemic. And so things were a little bit different. And you're going to notice a, a few changes uh, from, from one year to the next that, that may have been uh, influenced or informed by uh, how crisis providers have had to manage and continue operating services through a global pandemic. So two important uh, things to keep in mind, it sounds like, as we dive through the responses is, one, almost double the participants, and two, we're looking at things through the lens of perhaps post-pandemic or at least starting to get on the other side of things. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So our first map here shows uh, our who, where our participants were from. And uh, our, our survey respondents came from 27 states, and it represents 59% of the states with crisis residential services. Now, some people might be thinking, why doesn't 27 just represent, you know, half of them or 54 percent, because that would would be 27 out of 50. Well, that's because there's a handful of states that don't have a crisis residential level of care. 
And we say that hoping that we can add the word yet onto the end of that. Uh, so you notice the states that are uh, very lightly colored. So I think we're talking about uh, four states, Idaho, Nevada, uh, Louisiana, and Florida. We don't see uh, having a uh, an option like the having the features that we described mm -hmm. on the earlier slide. And if they do, uh, we would also add kind of a qualifier that most crisis residential programs are unlocked. And so uh, you, you may see some locked facilities, but they start to resemble psych inpatient a little bit more than they would a crisis residential program. So Travis, there's certainly a lot that goes into making a crisis residential unit operate or all the pieces that have to come together to provide great care. So some of those are outlined here. So one of the questions that the survey looked at was around a bundled rate for crisis residential services and what all was included in that per diem rate. So wondering if you could point out some uh, key considerations or things that maybe stood out from the respondents. Certainly. So just for context, uh, many of you may only uh, have operated services in your state and therefore only been exposed to those services. So we kind of parsed out the funding of these services into two areas, bundled and unbundled. So a bundled rate means we're going to include things like uh, the medications, the food that we serve, the, uh, the clinical services, the peer support services, uh, and in some cases, even the prescriber uh, costs all into one rate, and then that is uh, billed to the uh, to the payer. The other option is unbundled, and that's when you have a Medicaid billable code for every single service that you provide. Tess, you and I saw this actually a few months ago mm -hmm. when we visited a program in West Virginia. It was very interesting because they had a very regimented group schedule that started at 8 a.m. and it ended at maybe 7 or 8 p.m. And part of the reason for having such a regimented process was that they got paid when they offered services. You know, there wasn't, mm -hmm. there wasn't a bundled rate. So it was important that nursing, peer support, um, uh, uh, the, seeing the prescriber and going to groups happened on a regular basis. That's kind of what, what kept their program going. And, and it's, it's important to know that, that one, one type isn't inherently mm -hmm. better than another, but it certainly creates a set of incentives that providers have to follow. So I wanna draw your attention to two areas here and we, uh, on the top, we've got uh, the number of respondents. And remember, the, the N here is, is 97. So 97 respondents. Here's the ones who said we have a bundled rate and, and this is the number of, uh, you know, th th this is the, the service that is included in that. So you'll notice that the 2019 and 2022 numbers on the bottom. I want to draw your attention to two things. First, the use of peer supports has nearly doubled in our respondents from 2019 to 2022 or if it hasn't, if the utilization hasn't doubled, the inclusion of it as part of the bundled rate has doubled. And I would say those are those are probably the same thing. So kudos to those of you who have added peer support services uh, in the last few years and recognize the value that they bring to your team. And then the other one to draw your attention to is transportation. You'll see that, uh, uh, that second uh, red circle there. Transportation costs actually went down. Um, uh, or, or I, I shouldn't say cost, the percentage of those who included transportation in their costs. So what this makes me think is that perhaps crisis residential providers are transporting fewer people. Mm -hmm. Now, is this a result of the pandemic? I don't know. If you have a reason, uh, please feel free to type it into the chat. And if we can't see it in real time, uh, we'd love to, to address it or talk about it when we get to Q&A. Um, but it's an interesting stat. I don't know if you if you have any theories on that test, but uh, you, know, you know, a double digit decrease mm -hmm. in transportation being included. Yeah, so I'm curious to hear from the chat about the transportation. I I will say for the peer support, though, in just re uh, reviewing the respondents and some of the comments that they left, it was interesting because certainly we've experienced a workforce uh, shortage and crisis at this point as it relates to COVID and no uh, service industries have really been spared from that. And so we've seen a huge push, not just for crisis residential units to include peers because they offer such great quality of service and that lived experience component, but also because of hiring and the availability of work of workforce. So the inclusion of peers into services post COVID certainly could be explained by that. Yeah, and there was a comment that just came in actually that, that mentioned perhaps the workforce issues where you used to be able to send the minivan or the station wagon, whatever you have, uh, the, the car at your program 
to go and pick somebody up from the hospital or take them to right. the ER. Now you have to call an ambulance mm -hmm. because you're sh you're so short staffed that you can't take that person off the floor. Correct. Yeah, you've got to have those staffing ratios. And if one person's gone for a three hour drop off, you put the rest of the program at risk. So exactly. certainly. So let's talk about those sources of funding of, of bundled uh, funding versus unbundled. Of those using a fee for service model of payment where you deliver the service and then you get paid for it afterwards, 73% uh, of them are bundled, which means that services are grouped together, paid in that per diem rate. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that's interesting. As I said before, incentives uh, drive behavior uh, of the provider. And Tess, I, maybe you could talk a little bit because you also worked in crisis residential. Um, what was it like for you or for the team that you worked with to kind of as a as operating in a fee for service model to have this pressure to keep your beds full? Did it ever affect your decision making when you had like a particularly acute client or, you know, what 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 kind of um, of effects did that structure have? Certainly, I think it's probably not uncommon to uh, to it's almost impossible to shield yourself from that external pressure that gets placed by having your beds full and that sort of thing and keeping a high census. I will say though, I felt fortunate to work for a team in an organization that really stayed true to uh, person-centered care. And occasionally we would have acute individuals who needed beyond the 14 days or the mm -hmm. care transition was just going to take a little bit longer. So really just being able to honor that individual's journey and where they were at. But I think certainly it's challenging when you're trying to make sure that the program is sustainable and stays around for a long time. Yeah, certainly. So this is probably the the number that, that our attendees are the most interested in of this entire report. If you've already downloaded it, uh, then maybe you went right to this page. And if you haven't downloaded it, by the way, go to tvdsolutions.com, click on our writings, and you can download it for free. Uh, but the rate here is $453 a day. That was the average. So the way that we got there, instead of collecting every single individual number, is we said, okay, choose your per diem rate to the nearest $50. Okay. Okay. So then we had, it ranges from any, I want to say 200 all the way up to eight or $900 per day. Um, and some of you are like, where is those uh, $800 programs? I'd like to operate services there. Uh, but, the, but the average per diem was 453 Compare that to the 2019 survey at 410, you know, we're seeing about a 10% increase, which over three years would be about 3% per year. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that's kept up with inflation, uh, especially in the last year, it probably hasn't, but it's really good fodder. It's really good information because if you then know your per diem rate, maybe you, you sent it into us as part of the survey, um, then you can say, well, I want to bring this rate to our county, or I want to bring this rate to our Medicaid health plan and say, you know, we're getting underpaid by 10, 20, 30 mm percent, -hmm. and there should be more equity here. Now, we don't know how people calculated their per diem rate per se, because you may also get paid in a way where um, you receive grant funding or um, a, a, an allocated amount every month regardless of how many services that you provide. So another way to do that would just say, add up all the, you know, the, the units, uh, the, you know, each, each day of a stay that somebody was there and divide it by how much money you got for your crisis residential program. Um, and, but however you figured it out, um, have a way to compare that to, have a way to compare your number to what, what the national average is. And that's gonna bring us into an exercise here. So we'd all love you to pull out your phones and scan this QR code here in the upper left corner. Once you do that, we'd like you to answer this question that we have as it pertains to the, the closest psychiatric hospital to you or the one that your clients might most likely be referred to. And just, just like we did in the survey, we want you to round that to the nearest $50. So if you can go ahead and scan that, it uh, looks like we've got our first couple of participants, which is great. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of time as we start to see your answers come up um, on the screen.
<laughs> appreciate the honesty. Yep. So we've got some numbers starting to roll in. A thousand, twelve hundred, eight hundred dollars, fifteen hundred. <laughs> we see a correction in there. Okay, you were trying to maybe get to the um, the decimal points. Okay, eleven $1 hundred dollars uh, we see for for a daily rate. Some as low as six hundred, some as high as as fifteen hundred per day. Um, Twenty five hundred. Wow, very expensive. So it's important for y'all to, to know these numbers, because if you've attended a, a webinar from TBD Solutions or if you've been involved with the Crisis Residential Association, you know that crisis residential programs are designed to be either a diversion from inpatient or a step down from inpatient. And let's say I use this example often, Tess, but let's say that a person comes into a, a, a psych inpatient facility and they come in on a Monday, they're ready to discharge on a Friday but they don't have much of a social support system. Mm -hmm. They came in for suicidal ideation or for a suicide attempt. The doctor isn't ready to discharge them to home without support there. So let's let's take one of these numbers. We see a thousand up there. So if it's already been a $5,000 length of stay from Monday to Friday, it's gonna be another 3,000 to get them to Monday, Friday, excuse me, Saturday, Sunday, and then mm -hmm. discharging on Monday, okay? So if it's an extra $3,000, and you can actually offer a service over the weekend for $450, you're saving the community a lot of money. You're getting that person out of a locked unit and back one step closer to their home. Certainly, and still affording them nearly all of the same services that they would have received uh, while inpatient. They're still going to get access to a multidisciplinary team. They're going to get treatment services, group therapy services. So a really good option uh, for step down from a psychiatric inpatient unit. Also a great way. We know the research has shown us, Trav, that when individuals are discharging from psychiatric inpatient units, they are at highest risk for suicide uh, during that transition time. So a crisis residential unit offers a really great step down uh, avenue or option for individuals who might just need a few extra days, like you said, to skill build. Yep. So we want to show you an example of how you can put these cost savings to use and advocate for uh, your program to be utilized more and, and to be respected as a, a high quality program that's also saving the community mm -hmm. money. So we have a traditional path here of a person in crisis going to the emergency department, and we've got some, some data that we've uh, built this off of, which you can see those references on the bottom, but we've got $530 per visit to the ED, plus a five-day length of stay at a psychiatric hospital. And in this case, we're using a rate of about $700 per day, so a $3,500 length of stay. We've got a $4,000 visit there if they go through that pathway. Now, if we can replace psych inpatient with crisis residential, they stay a day, day uh, or a day and a half longer than they would at the psych hospital. Um, you're going to actualize a savings of about 20% compared to using the inpatient route. Now, if you can have those other parts of the continuum that you talked about, tasks like the mobile crisis teams diverting the emergency department visit altogether, then we're starting to see a savings of something closer to 34% versus the inpatient plus emergency department route. So this is really important because if you can repeat this process time and time again, so at the very bottom, you notice we've got 200 hospital referrals diverted to crisis res. This is less than one per day, okay? This is about four per week. Uh, average savings is $1,365 per stay. You're saving the community a quarter of a million dollars by, wow. by doing that. Pretty important. The larger your crisis program, the more people you divert, the more money you can save. And this information and these numbers, Travis, in addition to the per diem rates that we were talking about earlier, I know at the end you're going to give some helpful takeaways or recommendations, but one of those is around advocating for crisis residential units or the existence of these programs and having this knowledge at hand to say, look at the cost savings, look at the mm -hmm. return on investment can be so critical to the success and long-term sustainability. Certainly. So I'm going to talk about uh, the diversified funding sources test, and then um, I'd love to, to have you talk about some of how uh, funding sources have changed. So first of all, a quarter of those that responded contract with private health insurance plans. And we wish that number was higher, 
I think that that should be an effort in the in the interest of parity that people with a behavioral health benefit uh, in at a, for a commercial health plan should have access to crisis care mm -hmm. as well. We've seen pockets of this in places like Virginia with uh, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield and with Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, where they have contracted with private health insurance plans, um, but it's not happening enough. So uh, a, a little bit of homework for y'all. If you have commercial health insurance, we encourage you this week to turn your card over, look for that number that talks about your behavioral health benefit and ask them what services are covered. And if the continuum is not covered yet in your community, it should be, and we need to do a better job of advocating for um, consistent crisis coverage across uh, health plans. Yeah, so you'll you know you'll see in addition some of these percentages around you know fifty nine to sixty percent shared that their funding sources have not significantly changed. Others have shared that twelve percent are starting to work with private insurance. But if you click to the next slide, Travis, a lot of the feedback from participants. Uh, I just want to share one quote in general around this was this has always been the hope but there has never been an accessible path to establishing this relationship there's just too many barriers and this was said about trying to partner with the private or commercial health insurance plans of their they're wanting to serve those individuals with that insurance however they're met with barrier and barrier um, so it's unfortunate we're wanting to open access but they're unable to get through some of those barriers Yes, you know, I think what would be really helpful is actually if uh, organizations like NAMI and Mental Health America would start to step up and take some advocacy towards this parity that we're talking about. Um, it, it can't just be the providers alone, especially those of you working fee for service, unbundled, you know, constantly, uh, you know, trying to keep your program running. Uh, if you don't have that space as a manager or director to advocate and, and diversify your, your payer mix, then it has to happen. Uh, at a, a level higher than you in the organization mm -hmm. or with the help of some of these advocacy groups. Yeah, great suggestion. So the next question in the, the survey said, how has your program decreased cost or offset expenses in the recent past? Uh, the highest percentage of respondents, 18% said adding or increasing interns. Um, if you're able to use the um, either the thumbs up or the raised hand feature. We'd love to just see how many of y'all have interns within your programs. How many of you are, um, uh, you know, incorporating them? Or uh, if if those are disabled, I apologize. I know Alex was able to, to raise her thumb. I see Michelle's hand up. Thank you, Michelle. Um, you know, interns, once you have a good uh, training uh, process and an onboarding process, you can get them to quickly adding value to your program mm -hmm. by supplementing what clinicians do, supplementing maybe what some direct mm -hmm. uh, support professionals do as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw reducing staff was one way that, that people reduce cost. We certainly know that during the pandemic, a lot of times beds were shut down. Right. Uh, some programs like uh, uh, Dee Dee Hirsch's uh, uh, Excelsior House in Los Angeles um, dedicated some of their beds to being COVID. Bad. So it was kind of, you know, if you need crisis residential and you have COVID, you can go there. Uh, but we saw census drop down. And if your funding is directly related to keeping your beds full, you bring the beds down, you mm -hmm. got to reduce costs in some way. Uh, and then we see some other examples there of energy saving initiatives, soliciting donations from local grocers, uh, the use of the food pantries, and then uh, fundraisers as well. A lot of feedback and response from the survey participants around the need to uh, decrease costs or offset related to food and groceries specifically. So a lot of crisis residential units purchase and then prepare meals for the individuals who are staying there. And certainly we've all probably experienced the increase in cost around groceries and, and food. And so um, that was a huge theme throughout the responses were just finding ways to get food at a reasonable cost to keep programs operating. Yeah, and these crisis programs were hit by supply chain issues too. Mm -hmm. So things like hand sanitizer, um, uh, you know, other uh, sanitary equipment, uh, really hard to uh, to get a hold of in the last, uh, you know, up until maybe about a year ago. So we have a couple recommendations on what to do with this report, how it could probably um, help you and and help your community to have sustainable funding. That's the goal. We would never want to see programs close because they don't have. The, um, the 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 dollars there to support them, even though the service is valuable. Uh, the first is to share it. 
Uh, find out if your community partners, especially your payer, has seen it. If you belong to a, um, let's say, a, a network of crisis residential providers or crisis stabilization providers, uh, share it with them too. Ask if they've seen it. Uh, bring it up at one of your next partner meetings that might happen on a monthly basis so you can talk about um, you know, what, what their reactions are, how it relates to their experience. The second one is to calculate your total cost of care. Um, now, total cost of care is, is not always uh, a, a, a tacit uh, piece of knowledge that crisis residential providers ha have, um, but it's important because if you don't know how much your services cost, you don't know how much you should be charging people for them. And so this can get down to a very granular level of saying, well, how much is our rent hmm. or our lease? How much are the uh, the cars that the car insurance that we have? So if you have people in finance, like Tess, I'm sure you and I have worked with some pretty smart people in, in the finance departments that are past organizations. You know that they know what a pro forma can say about a crisis program, and get down to that level to say, hey, every time somebody comes in, we give them a welcome bag, we feed them. Those things cost money. As a result. Here's how much we have to charge. That's a really important step for a savvy Certainly. crisis residential provider. Um, the third is to uh, compare where you're at with your funding with where you want to be. And similarly, how much um, risk do you bear every time somebody comes into your crisis program? And are you compensated adequately for that? Mm -hmm. Some of the most expensive parts of the continuum, like emergency departments and psychiatric hospitals, they're that expensive because they have to bear risk, mm -hmm. you know, because they have to sometimes uh, restrain people or, um, you know, to uh, kind of like intervene right. quickly in a in a emergency situation, and they have to have the tools to do that, so they have to get paid accordingly. Yeah, I think though it's it's. Uh, certainly, Travis, in our experience working in these programs and potentially others of you on this call, uh, crisis residential units, as we talked about, serve as a diversion and as a step down. But often for the diversion, we would serve individuals in our programs who had very high risk and acuity and who the inpatient units uh, sometimes weren't interested in serving or uh, perhaps we were able to treat them uh, more effectively sometimes than the inpatient unit. So I think that uh, it's important to recognize that crisis residential units are able to safely serve and provide treatment to individuals with high acuity and to do so really safely. That's really important, Tess, because the continuum that you walked us through, some people think that as a linear continuum right? and that everybody behaves in the same way. But we've seen that time and time again, where a psychiatric inpatient hospital will have a list of people that they won't accept, or they'll hear somebody who is of a certain nature, maybe it's volatility, maybe it's a history of violence, where they'll say no. Mm -hmm. A psych hospital will say no. And then a crisis residential program will say yes, and they will actually serve that person. And that person, when they're given the choice the next time they're in crisis, they choose crisis residential because, uh, because they want to be there. It's, it's an active choice. Great point. Um, and then the last uh, recommendation is to advocate. Uh, we think it's important that you take this information to your stakeholders to start a discussion about are these services funded appropriately? And if they're not, and if your, your current funders um, cite a lack of resources um, that, that they can't, uh, that things can't change, then get creative about that conversation about how to find other solutions. Uh, we've been fortunate to be uh, exposed to some really cool um, uh, philanthropic organizations in the past year. Organizations that think outside of the box and that actually want to support crisis services. Uh, Sozo Safe Foundation is a great example. Uh, they are based in Philadelphia, but they have a, a national landscape and a port national portfolio of uh, advocates who are helping to decriminalize mental illness. So if your service in some way helps to keep people, let's say out of restrictive settings like jails, then this would be a great place to search for funding opportunities. Uh, but some of the best programs we see, they're complementing their primary funding source with other funding sources, talking to the county next door, saying, hey, we could help you to keep people out of the hospital and save you, like we showed you in that graphic, a half million or quarter million dollars a year. 
get, you know, just getting creative in some of these solutions, even talking to your local community foundations and saying, hey, could you even, could we even find a partnership of 10 or $15,000 uh, per year? That might be the difference between you being able to have a part-time peer support and a full-time peer support, for example. Any other advocacy ideas you want to share, Tess, or anything else from these recommendations? Yeah, kind of goes along with advocacy, but just, you know, reminding community partners the role that your program plays in the community. Perhaps you don't have a full crisis continuum, that graphic that we showed, uh, you know, it's an ideal continuum and not every county or every community has all of those resources, but just reminding the hospital systems and law enforcement and all of those different community partners who might use those services, remind them that you're there and that you uh, are able to divert or remind them of the mission and those core components. Oftentimes, uh, they have high turnover as well, or they maybe they're onboarding new staff who aren't familiar with your services. So just, we used to call it the dog and pony show, but yeah. really just putting in the hard work and labor to advocate for your services and remind community partners that you exist and that your doors are open. And if, if you've ever had these ambitions as a supervisor or a director in a program, but you felt like you haven't had the margin to think about these things, we encourage you to have a conversation with your supervisor to say, hey, what would it look like if one afternoon a month, four hours, I could have my work covered so that I could focus on some of these other areas of how I really want to grow the program? Uh, because the most successful crisis residential programs that Tess and I have seen in the country have wiggle room or capacity for the staff to do other things besides just run the program. They get to do the dog and pony show, mm -hmm. like you talked about, drive across the state, um, you know, talk to advocates, talk to prospective funders so that they can help to build the, the program of the future that they want. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just some final thoughts. Uh, the work that you're doing, if you are a crisis residential provider, is very important. Uh, and if you're an advocate or an ally of crisis residential programs, please uh, know the value and the importance of these services. If you're not familiar with them, um, check out the Crisis Residential Association. Check out the literally dozens of research articles going back to the 1970s that demonstrate the triple aim of healthcare benefits for crisis residential programs. High uh, client satisfaction, strong clinical outcomes, and uh, reduce cost. Crisis residential programs have done all of those things over the years. And it's really uh, important that we have the current ones sustain and continue, as well as building up new ones in communities that, that don't have these services. So uh, with that, uh, you know, as we think about the, the future, just to, I wanted to share a little map with you. This is kind of a heat map that shows where crisis programs exist across the country. Now, these are not just crisis residential programs. Uh, these are all types, and, and we've got a, a little radius on there uh, that kind of shows. We would love to see crisis residential in every major metropolitan area, let's say 250,000 people or more in a county, um, all across the country, as well as to see an adequate uh, uh, continuum of crisis services within those communities as well. So again, if you want to download the, the report and you haven't yet, you can go to tbdsolutions.com to do that. And we wanted to make some time now for uh, some questions and some reflections. So uh, we're going to uh, pull down our slides and um, we will uh, kind of check the chat and see uh, what people are thinking and uh, would love to get to some of your questions. So, and Al, if you want to, Alex, if you want to, um, to pop in, feel free. And we'll also kind of uh, look back here at the chat for a second. So it looks like there was some information that came in about uh, caring contacts. Thank you, Miranda, for fielding um, a question about that. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to put them into the chat. Uh, looks like David was a, a frequent contributor today. Thank you, David. It says, uh, we were talking about saving money in the immediate, but long-term it helps to reduce frequent recidivism while also encouraging and uh, promoting community inclusion. It's a really good point, David, that if you can if you can treat a, a person with dignity and respect in a home-like environment and you can do it really well, uh, you can um, minimize 
the um, the need for for future hospitalizations. And you know, something else, Tess, that makes me think of is, uh, you know, I would often talk to our team when a person came back to the program because I knew it would frustrate them at times. They would say, you know, this person was just here for ten days. Think of the think of the work that they put in, and now it's um, now we got to start over. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I would mention to them is that. It's important to remember that we're creating a therapeutic environment here that people are appreciative of and benefiting from. And if they come back to somewhere where we call them by their preferred name mm -hmm. and we take the time to get to know them and they fe it feels kind of like home here, then it's not the worst thing in the world if they come back. I'd rather have them come back here than if they needed help and they didn't come back or if they they went to a psychiatric hospital, let's say. Um, you know, it's it's important to not um, forget that people might be coming back besides the crisis, they're coming back because they appreciated the experience that they had. And the connection, the ability to uh, connect with others in a safe space and to gain skills. You know, often we talk about individuals might present into a crisis residential unit multiple times, but the hope is that they're addressing a unique part of their life crisis or a stressor with, with every visit, every time they come back. So just being mindful of the narrative that sometimes gets created. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got another question that came in from uh, Elizabeth. It says, throughout your research, did you find the per diem rate for youth stabilization differed significantly for adult stabilization? And do you have numbers for that? Um, Elizabeth, I can speak uh, a little bit anecdotally about that. There is a youth crisis residential program that I'm familiar with in the state of Kentucky, uh, which unfortunately for about 20 years has, had a, uh, has not had a rate change. Uh, the rate has been right around $220 per day, uh, and that is, that is a youth program. Now, we didn't uh, like bifurcate or, or analyze our data down to the youth versus adult level, um, but I don't know that we've seen any significant changes between, between those types of programs. The, the, the provider would theoretically have to provide a justification as to why there would be a difference if, if they're staffed at the same ratios, um, if they're staffed at a higher ratio in the youth program, then certainly I think we might see, you know, uh, a 10, uh, you know, between a 10,000 and 70,000 dollar difference between those two. But um, but we didn't we didn't necessarily ask for that within the survey. Hi, Anne. Uh, Anne said, what did you attribute the increase in clinical services from 2019 to 2022 in the survey results? Um, let me just go ahead and uh, take a look at that again. Um, so that would have been. Um, yeah, it said from 77% to 91%. That, that is a good, um, a good catch, Anne. Uh, Tess, do you have any theories, first of all, before I, before I come up with one as I pull the slide back <laughs> on the screen? Uh, why might there have been such a significant increase, if you look right in the, mm -hmm. the bottom left there, of uh, the presence of, of clinical services as part of a bundled rate? Yeah, that's great. I'm curious as well. Um, I Part of me wants to believe that it it potentially is related to um, COVID or perhaps just the need for more uh, clinical services, given the acuity of individual. We know that so many individuals uh, during the time of COVID and after experienced either for the first time behavioral health issues or a crisis. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I'm curious um, to hear Travis or from other um, individuals in the chat, if you've noticed that in your own program and what you attribute that to. Uh, Tessa's, uh, excuse me, Miranda's guess is national attention on crisis services and their amazing outcomes. Uh, and we don't ask specifically about the type of clinical services, but where we have seen programs uh, be progressive is in adding um, an art therapist or recreational therapist, a music therapist, uh, that you know that would add to the the number of clinicians that are there. Um, an, another thing might be that uh, previously the clinical services, like a social worker, may have been unbundled. Mm. It might have been here's room and board and and frontline staff and medications, and then your doctor, nurse, and clinician are, are separate. And so perhaps those have been uh, those have been brought in together, but. We don't really see many examples of a, a program that does not have a social worker or a clinician um, within the program. We see them contracted sometimes, 
uh, just just outside of the Detroit area, there's a, a, a basically a, a county that partners with a provider. The the county brings in the clinical, the the clinician I should say, and the doctor, and then the provider brings in the direct care staff mm -hmm. and, and the nurses. Um, so Travis, one question I know that um, we've had individuals ask was around, will there be a 2023 survey? And if so, how can um, individuals either participate or get involved? Uh, that's a great question. There will be a survey uh, uh, distributed in 2023, probably early 2023, but it, it probably won't be on funding. Okay. So we have taken different efforts. For those of you, a, a few years ago during the pandemic, we sent out a national survey to crisis residential, mobile crisis, and crisis call centers to understand the crisis worker experience during the pandemic. You know, was was the volume of services increasing or decreasing? How was morale? How was you know your experience in in trying to to keep these services going? You can also find that on our website uh, in the same place that you would uh, download the crisis funding survey report. So we will be sending out more surveys. Stay tuned. Stay in tune to uh, tbdsolutions.com. Or if you want to uh, join our mailing list, you can email training at tbdsolutions.com uh, and we can let you know about uh, our upcoming surveys and trainings and things like that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So we're getting uh, near the end here, but I want to take one or two more questions uh, or comments. One is from uh, Jenna, our, our friend in Wisconsin. Our primary state psychiatric facility recently informed us of a significant increase in acute symptomatology which would definitely lead to increased need for clinical services over other services. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, Jenna. And I, I would say now for maybe 10 years or so, we've heard of a, a, an increased, medic, increased medical acuity, mm -hmm. kind of comorbidity of physical and behavioral health, uh, which creates uh, a very challenging dynamic for the nursing teams and medical teams within crisis residential, because your, your nursing assessment takes longer. Your time right. to get all of the medications uh, verified by the doctors takes longer. Mm -hmm. um, and it can put a strain on the staff too if they're being asked to do more than just typical uh, care. Oh my gosh, my homeboy, Travis, same name. Uh, this this will probably be our, our last question for today. Have you run into programs that are part of a CCBHC? If so, what financial impacts are being seen? And if not, what are their anticipated impacts? Yes, you want to talk about CCBAC? Yeah, I, um, I've i not had any interface or um, I don't know of any specific programs related to the impacts that they're experiencing um, outside of the things that we already talked about with workforce or increased demand for, um, you know, clinicians and um, multidisciplinary team staffing. I can tell you that... Uh, Certainly, the CCBHC grant recipients, and I'm thinking of the, the providers, mm -hmm. are getting very creative in mm -hmm. the types of teams that they're offering. So, for example, a, a provider in uh, the, the on the east side of Michigan, they already have mobile crisis in their community, but they want to offer mobile crisis just for their clients, mm -hmm. and they're putting it underneath the CCBHC grant. Uh, so the dollars are able to be um, invested in the infrastructure and the development of those services. Uh, and it's obviously open to anyone. They don't, uh, you know, right. unlike a, a Medicaid funded program, uh, you can have any type of insurance and still uh, receive these services. So it may be a little too early to tell, Travis, but uh, I do believe I know of one state that just had a meeting recently where they were talking about the impact of uh, crisis um uh, excuse me, CCBHC on crisis services. So I'm happy to, uh, if I can find some some notes from that meeting, I'm happy to, to send those along. Great question. Yeah. So uh, Tess, you know, uh, uh, as opposed to kind of running all the way to the end and, and uh, making people late for the next meeting, I think it's probably a good stopping point. Uh, again, we really appreciate y'all's time in uh, sharing this with us as we talked about this, this survey and look for... Uh, Look for, look for another survey coming out here in a few months as we talk about uh, other ways to be the most helpful and to build out uh, a sustainable crisis continuum. Yeah, thank you all so much for your time and participation today. Yep. Take care. If you want to follow us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, you can do that. Uh, we'd love to engage with you that way. Um, if not, thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Cheers. Bye.